Hallelujah. Um, this is the first time I'm sharing on a Wednesday, so um, my heart rate is is as if I'm sprinting right now. Um, but thank you so much to uh, Pastor for letting me have this honor of sharing the word this evening. This evening, I'd like to share a message based off Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 8. And the, the title is, The Law of the Spirit of Life. The Law of the Spirit of Life. So scripture reading comes from uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 1 to 8. I'll read for you. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh in order, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. This is the word of the Lord. So as an introduction, let's take a short recap back into uh, the previous chapter of how uh, the last words the Apostle Paul said before this morning, uh, this evening's scripture passage. So first, Apostle Paul, he talks about the internal conflict within himself about the, the, his mind being set on the law of God, but his actions, his flesh, doing the things that he doesn't want to do, going according to his sinful nature. Let's see, Romans chapter 7, verses 21 to 25. I read for you. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God my in, in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. See, the Apostle Paul here has a conflict within himself. The law of God, he wants to serve with his mind, but his flesh serves the law of sin. Now, flesh here doesn't just mean, it doesn't really mean the physical fleshly body that we have, but it refers to the sinful nature. It is a met metaphorical term referring to the sinful, fallen human nature that we have that is inclined to the carnal things, the non-spiritual things. So here, let's look, right? He says, I myself serve the law of God with my mind on one hand, and, the, and with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. There's this internal struggle within him. And it is sort of useful to think of it as a war over the soul. Is, my, is your soul in war right now? This evening, does your soul have this kind of conflict, this kind of tension that I, I have to strive every day to do the things of God? But my flesh keeps dragging me down. My sinful ways keep dragging me down. And so for, for us to simplify it, we can look at it like this, right? For your mind, right? Your mind knows what's right, but it has no might. It has no power to act on it. Your mind knows what's right, but has no might. What about the flesh? Your sinful nature isn't right. But it has might. Oh yes, it has might. There is a lot of power in that sinful nature that keeps dragging you down. You know, as a, since I was around 14, I, I really came to terms with this struggle. And for many years, I, I, every night I remember wrestling with 
with myself wrestling before God and saying, you know, like God, you know, I've done it again. You know, I've sinned again. And and God, I, I've messed up. I've goofed up this time. So, you know, can you please help me? Because I'm, I know, you know, because right now I feel very condemned. I don't think I'm going to heaven, God. Help me because, you know, I've sinned again. Now, for me, this message is to that that 15-year-old kid who didn't really understand that God doesn't do things that way. You know, when you are in Christ, as we read in the scripture passage, when you're in Christ, there is no condemnation. So this message is to that young boy who doesn't know, doesn't know God to this extent. So what is Apostle Paul's response? Right. The big the big question now is can we have assurance despite the ongoing power of sin in our lives? Can we have assurance? And so Paul's response in, in Romans chapter 8, he says three things. First, sin no longer has the power to condemn those who are in Christ. Second, the Holy Spirit applies the benefits of Jesus' sacrifice to us. And third, we are thus empowered to walk according to the law of the Spirit of life. And so the big idea for this evening's message is this. The law of the Spirit of life makes right and gives might, so have Christ in your sight. The law of the Spirit of life makes right and gives might, so have Christ in your sight. So the, the law that we were talking about, right, you know, let's let's talk about that for a little bit. Right now we're in Singapore. You don't want to be doing drugs in this country. You don't want to be smoking weed. You don't want to get caught. Because the police force acts upon the law and the law of Singapore is very, very strict upon these things. Right? You could do it. You know, you can be you can you can smoke weed in Amsterdam. Right? It's fine over there. Just don't do it here. Because the law of Singapore is very strict. What about this law of the spirit of life? We are going to look into that this evening and compare this law of the spirit of life against the law of sin and death. So let's just really look very closely. Let's look closely first at um, Romans chapter 8 verses 1 to 4. Romans chapter 8 verses 1 to 4. Right. First we have the, the what. The Apostle Paul says, the what? What was the fact? The fact is there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's the fact. And then the how. How is this possible? How can it be? For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And then how part two? For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. Right? By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. And then finally, the why. Why? In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So, let's look at this verse 1. What? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The word for condemnation here is katakrima in Greek. And kata means against. Krima means judgment. And it's a legal term. It's kind of You hear this kind of term in the courtroom. And so it basically means, right, condemnation basically means that the verdict is against you. It's, a, it's not in your favor. That's the verdict. And only the judge declares or withholds condemnation. So when the Apostle Paul says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, he's saying that at one point, you stood condemned. At one point, the verdict was against you. But now, therefore now, so, at a certain point in history, the condemnation is off the table. At a certain point in history, you were redeemed, you were saved, the verdict 
is now swinging in your favor. So let's see this courtroom here. Okay, you have the judge, there's you, and there's the jury. And what is the evidence? Okay, what is the evidence? Because to, to really understand this verse, we have to look at what Apostle Paul is not saying. Okay, we have to see what Apostle Paul is not saying. Romans chapter 7, verse 22 and 23, Apostle Paul himself testifies. He says, For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. So what's the evidence? What about tonight? If we look at ourselves, look at our lives, what is the evidence? Is the evidence in our favor or not? Because all our actions still testify to the ongoing power of sin, right? The evidence is that we still cannot live according to the perfect obedience of the law. We still cannot obey the law fully. We still sin, we still fall, daily we stumble and daily we sin. So what's the evidence? The evidence is swinging against us. The evidence points against us. And so the jury looks at the evidence, the jury looks at us, and the jury screams at the judge and says, Condemn him. Condemn him. Condemn her. Why? Because that person is a sinner. The Apostle Paul here, he is not saying that there is anything in us not worthy of condemnation. The Apostle Paul is saying, right, he's not saying that we deserve to go free. He's not saying that we deserve to be, you know, to have a good verdict. No. In fact, the Apostle Paul is only saying those who are in Christ Jesus are free from condemnation. There is no condemnation from this, from that point onwards, from the eschatological now, from this now onwards, there is no condemnation. It is off the table. And so no matter what the jury says, no matter what the evidence says, please trust and have faith in the judge. Because the Apostle Paul said there is no condemnation, right? God has no condemnation for you if you are in Christ Jesus. So the condition, what's the condition? You must be in Christ Jesus, right? What, what does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? Colossians chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Having been buried with Him in baptism, in which you were raised, you were also raised with Him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised Him from the dead. It is through faith, right, that we are united in Christ. We are in Christ through faith. It is through that trust in God's work. The God, the Son, who died for us. So baptism is really important as well, right? Because baptism manifests that union with Christ. Ba baptism is the outward symbolism that I am now one with Christ in His death and I will be one with Him in His resurrection. So we mustn't take baptism lightly, right? But it is through faith. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. It is through faith. And is it our merit? Is it to our merit that we have faith? No, it's not. It is not our own doing. It is the gift of God. It is God who imparts that faith to us. It is out of His mercy and His sovereign predestined choice that doesn't change and doesn't waver. And we see this, and who is the one who administers that faith? Who is the one who facilitates this uh, faith in us, this awakening of faith in us? John chapter 3, verses 5 to 6, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. 
It is the Holy Spirit who awakens faith in us toward Christ. It is the Holy Spirit who awakens us to the reality of Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be in Christ. It means to have faith in Christ through the Holy Spirit. So, let's look at the how. Okay. Apostle Paul says, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Now, the word for law here is nomos. The Greek word for law here is nomos, meaning law, principle, or procedure. And in this context, it doesn't really refer to the Mosaic law, the, the, the law that God gave Moses at Mount Sinai, but rather it refers to the government, the governing powers of each age. So like I said, like we talked about earlier, right? The law of Singapore and the law of Amsterdam. They're different laws. And depending on the law that governs you, your life is going to look different depending on that law. So in a sense, it, you can take it to be the principle, the principle of the spirit of life. Right? So, when was the change? See, in verse 1, right, Apostle Paul said, There is therefore now no condemnation. When was that change? The change is the difference between B.C. and A.D., before Christ and the year of our Lord. In B.C., they were living under the law of sin and death, before Christ came. Why? Why did, BC, uh, why did this law of sin and death reign before Christ? But it's very simple. Because the law of sin and death had power. It had the power of condemnation. It had the power of condemnation. Because why? Because the price had not been paid. The sin had been committed, but the price was not paid yet. And so this law of sin and death has this condemnation hovering over everyone. But now we come into A.D., after Christ has died on the cross. And, and now we are living under a different law, the law of the Spirit of life. For us, that is the now. We are living in that moment. So let's talk about what the law could not do. right? Because verse 3 says, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. What could the law not do? Is is there in the verse, right? God has done what the law could not do. What did, what did God do? He condemned sin in the flesh. So the law could not condemn sin in the flesh. But God did that. God, by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh. And who sinned? our sin. He condemned our sin in Christ's flesh. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, He Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By His wounds you have been healed. So, what does that mean? It means that in executing the full sentence of condemnation against sin, God removed sin's ability to dictate terms for those who are in Christ. What does that mean? Basically, before the price was paid, right, sin and condemnation, you know, sin still had condemnation in its ammo, right? I imagine sin having a revolver pointed at you, right? and says, look at the evidence of what this person has done. Look at what this person has done, this sin. And now that I have this ammo of condemnation that I can shoot at this person. But God comes and He takes that bullet away. He says, the condemnation has been done. And it has been done because my son has bore, has, my son, Jesus Christ, has borne the full brunt of judgment for sin. That's why now, sin no longer has any ammo. The law of sin and death has no more power to govern over those who are in Christ because the power of sin to condemn has been broken. 
because of Christ's death on the cross. On the cross, Christ took the full brunt of the condemnation that we deserve. And so now, the verdict swings in our favour because Christ has taken our place. The price has been paid. So, let's look at the why. Verse 4, why? In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. What, is this, what does this mean? It, it, it tells us the why of why God is doing all this, right? So what is this righteous requirement of the law? What is this righteous requirement of the law? There are two readings, and I think both are equally edifying. So I think we can really look at it quite closely. Uh, see, Paul's not saying that we are the ones doing the fulfilling of this righteous requirement of the law. We are not the ones doing it, right? It says, right, he writes in the passive voice. He says, right, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit so this is the this righteous requirement is going to be fulfilled in us we are the platform for where it's going to be fulfilled and later in Romans chapter 13 Paul tells us more about the fulfilling of the law Romans chapter 13 verses 8 to 10 Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So God sends His Son, Jesus Christ, to bear the condemnation for sin. He, Jesus Christ comes, he, He's hung on the cross and he, he gets beaten and wounded and he, he experiences abandonment from the Father. Why? So that we will learn love. So that we will learn what it is to love. And it says, right, Apostle Paul says in verse 4, he says, according to the Spirit. The difference is that those who walk according to the Spirit will have this righteous requirement of the law fulfilled in us. Those who walk according to the Spirit will learn love. How do we know this? Galatians chapter 6, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. L love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and on and on. But first and foremost, that fruit of the Spirit is love. So for us who walk in the Spirit, right? why did God do all this? Why did God send His Son, Jesus Christ, so that we would not be condemned? So that we would learn love, true love. Okay. Now, here's another reading. Okay. Fulfilled for us. This is theologically true. Okay. Right? That, right, that the righteous requirement of the law is not just fulfilled in us, but it's also fulfilled for us. That's what it means to be in Christ. Right? Uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 18 to 19. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the manner were made servants, uh, were, the manner were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. So there's a typo there. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Jesus Christ's righteousness, right? When we are in Christ through faith by the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ's own righteousness becomes our own. His perfect obedience covers us. That's why, you know, there's a very powerful verse in John 17 where Jesus does the high priestly prayer, right? He says this, and this is very important. He says in John 17 verse 19, And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. 
See what he says? And for whose sake? For their sake. For those who are going to be saved, right? For their sake, I consecrate myself. He's saying that my righteousness is going to be made theirs. That's why I'm, you know, that's why I consecrate myself. First Peter chapter 1, verse 2. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood. This is the Apostle Peter talking about the Gospel, right? The triune work of the Gospel. Now, who applies, who applies this righteousness of Christ to us? Who takes that righteousness of Christ and covers us with it? It's the Holy Spirit. That's why Apostle Paul, when he talks about no condemnation, no more judgment, no more, uh, you're right, no more judgment for the saints. He talks about the Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the one who sanctifies us. The Holy Spirit is the one who takes the obedience of Christ and covers us with it. And so the fulfillment of the law, the requirement of the law, the perfect obedience that God requires has been fulfilled for us in Christ and applied upon us by the Holy Spirit. So now, we've seen how the Spirit makes us right. Okay? What we've seen thus far is that the Spirit makes right. The Spirit makes us right before God by uniting us with the Son, the righteous Son. Now let's look at the other half of today's passage of how the Spirit gives might. Romans chapter 8, verses 5 to 8. So, let's read it. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, the, the, the verb to set the mind on something, right? in Greek, is phroneo. And it, it doesn't just mean to, to toy with something intellectually, to, to consider something theoretically. It doesn't just mean that. It means, it, it, it's a more general kind of uh, meaning that talks about the direction of your will, your reason, your understanding, and your affection. So basically, it means to cast your soul on something or to really wrap your head and your heart around something or maybe to prefer something over the other. So, Apostle Paul says it quite clearly here, right? The mindset on the flesh is death, it's hostile to God, it does not submit to God's law, and it cannot please God. What about the mindset on the Spirit? The mindset on the things of the Spirit is life and peace. It's quite simple. Apostle Paul is saying, if your mind is set on the flesh, then your judgment is awaiting you, right? There is condemnation awaiting you. But if your mind is set on the things of the Spirit, you're going to have life and peace. And this life here is not just a momentary breathing of physical life, right? It's not just a, a bit of physical life. He's talking about eternal life. So let's ask that question now. What are the things of the Spirit? What does the Holy Spirit set His mind on? Right? The things of the Spirit is the things that the Spirit sets His mind on. What does the Spirit Himself set His mind on? John chapter 16, verse 14. Jesus says, He, talking about the Holy Spirit, right? Jesus says, He will glorify Me, for He will take what is Mine and declare it to you. John chapter 14, verse 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in My name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all all that I have said to you. So what are the things of the Spirit? The Spirit's mind is set on glorifying the Son of God and His teachings because the Spirit loves the Son. 
the Holy Spirit's mind is set on Christ and on Christ's glory and on Christ's teaching. So, what does it mean for us then to have our minds set on the things of the Spirit? It means that we need to set our minds on Christ. right? Whoever the Spirit touches, whoever the Spirit breathes into, will think of Christ and will recognize Christ as their Savior. See, Paul just uh, earlier Paul talked about how the righteous requirement of the law right, is fulfilled in us. We saw that this righteous requirement of the law is love. Now the Holy Spirit's job is to teach us that love by pointing us to Christ. Right? The Spirit's job is to make us look to Christ and to recognize His love, His sacrificial death and His beauty. So in other words, the Spirit makes us love Christ by showing us Jesus Christ. The Spirit is like the lights in the room. When you don't focus on the light, but you focus on the things that the light illumines. Likewise, when the Spirit comes into your life, Jesus Christ comes into light. You will see Jesus Christ and you will recognize Him as your Lord and Savior, as someone who died for you, and you will learn to love Him. You will taste that love that Jesus has for you. So, what is the might of the Spirit? The might of the Spirit is the power to love something more and beyond oneself. In this case, the Spirit points us to Christ and makes us fall in love with Christ. One preacher, uh, a preacher once put it like this, that the Holy Spirit's job is to smite you with the beauty of Jesus Christ. That's quite powerful, isn't it? The Spirit's going to smite you and smack you in the head with the love and beauty of Christ. I pray that this evening, as we come to this passage, may that love for Christ truly come into our hearts. So before we conclude, let's look at the things of the flesh. What are the things of the flesh? Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 to 6. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. The things of the flesh grieved the Lord. Because the things of the flesh are only about evil. They don't consider the spiritual things. The things of the flesh are not spiritual at all. Right? It's only focused on the now, on the physical, carnal desires of the flesh. So people who are in the flesh, they cannot please God because their minds cannot submit to God's law. And Jesus even says this quite clearly in Matthew chapter 16, verse 23. Jesus said, right, But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. When we set our minds on the earthly things and not on the spiritual things, that's when even, we might even be hindrances to God's plan. So, we, you know, for those who walk according to the Spirit, right, we need to set our minds on the things of the Spirit. We need to set our minds on Christ and we need to go beyond the boundary of ourselves. We need to break through from our self-centeredness by looking to Christ, looking to the love that Christ has for us and falling in love with Christ. Only then, when we truly fall in love, will we be able to break free from our, bound, from our self-centeredness from living for ourselves, from satisfying only our own desires. Right? For the mind that is set on the flesh, Romans chapter 8, verse 7 to 8. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. We need to first understand, right, this idea of sin. That before it is even an action, sin is a relational brokenness. It is a relational thing before it is an action. And for us, right, we who have the Holy Spirit, when we look at Jesus Christ, we can recognize Him 
as our Lord and Saviour. And thus we are made right with God. But when we do not have Jesus Christ, then our relationship with God right, is, is broken. No matter how hard we try to mediate it on our own, no matter how, how hard we try on our own to earn our way into God's good graces, we cannot because we are unable to. We are fallen. We are sinful. But when that relationship with God is broken, even if God gives a law or gives a commandment, our sinful nature is going to energize us to break it. Romans chapter 7, verse 9, Apostle Paul, he says, right, I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. Do you see that dynamic here? It's like things were all fine until you told me to do something. And then because you told me to do something, I had to not do it. <laughs> That's the dynamic going on. But for us, right? For us who have the Holy Spirit, we can truly confess that Jesus, we can truly confess that we have a mediator, that we are made right with God, and that now through Jesus Christ, who has borne our condemnation, right, we are free to live according to God's will. First John chapter 4, verse 2. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. The incarnation is the central piece to us learning to love God, learning to for us to restore that relationship with God. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3 Therefore I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. When we, are, when we have the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit illumines Jesus Christ to our hearts, that's when we know we can truly come to God. We can come before God. That we are restored to Him. That we have a mediator. That, reach, that broken relationship with God is now repaired. And that is the might of the Spirit. That is the power of the Spirit that empowers us and energizes us to live according to God's will. So in conclusion, how can we have assurance in the Christian walk? Romans chapter 8, verse 1 to 4, we saw, right? The Spirit makes us right with God by making us one with the righteous Son. The Spirit makes us right with God by making us one with the righteous Son. And then in the latter half, we saw that the Spirit gives us might by setting our minds on Christ in love. The power of the Spirit is love. The might that the Spirit gives us is the power of love, that we fall in love with Christ and that we truly want to uh, go beyond our own self-centeredness to live for Jesus Christ. So what's the conclusion? The conclusion is, have Christ in sight. Whenever you feel maybe, you're, maybe you sin, maybe you feel like you've messed up, please remember that as long as Christ is in your sight, and He is, you have no condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And it's not as if it's not as if we are slipping in and out of condemnation like that. No, it's not like that. It's not like you sin and then for that moment, if you in that sin, you're gonna go to hell. And then you you quickly come before God and you repent and then God says, Okay, all right, I'm I'm holding condemnation away from you now. No longer is there condemnation. And then you sin again and then oh now there's condemnation hovering over you and then you, you repent and then now there's no more condemnation. That's not what Apostle Paul is saying here. He's saying there is now no condemnation if you're in Christ Jesus. As long as you, you have faith and you're united to Christ, there is no condemnation ever. So back to that courtroom. You, there's the judge, there's you, there's the jury, and there's the evidence. Let's conclude by reading this verse. 
First uh, John chapter one verses eight to nine. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Verse nine. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What is Apostle John saying? He's saying that the evidence still swings against us. The evidence is still not in our favor. We are still sinners and we still have to wrestle with this ongoing power of sin. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us. See, there's this, the, the word that Apostle John uses here is just. He doesn't say that God is going to forgive you out of His mercy. He's saying that God is going to forgive you out of His justice. And that, that has a really powerful connotation. What, is, what it means is this, okay? He is faithful and just. It means that, right, uh, picture this, okay? Jesus Christ is in heaven now, right? Our advocate interceding for us at the right hand of the Father, right? Hebrews chapter 7 tells us that, that Jesus is now interceding for us, right? Uh, between us and the Father. What it means for God to forgive us out of His justice means that Jesus is, you know, when, when we sin, Jesus doesn't go to God and say, oh, He sinned for the 10,000 and first time, you know, God, can you just forgive Him? Like, one more time, please. That's not what it means to forgive out of justice. That is out of mercy, but it is not what it means to forgive out of justice. For God to forgive out of justice is like this. If we sin, then Jesus Christ says to God the Father, God, He sinned, but for that sin, I've already paid the price. I've already paid the price for that sin. And that sin, and that sin, and that sin, and every sin that the person has committed and is going to commit, I've already paid the price. So, for God not to forgive is to go against His very own nature. Because why? Because God is a God of justice and the price has already been paid. Jesus Christ has already borne the full brunt of our condemnation. He has already borne the whole judgment upon His flesh. So for us today, I pray that we will not have that faith that slips in and out of condemnation and, and, and you know that God is constantly waiting to smack you and to hammer you into condemnation the moment you sin. Instead, let us have that image that Christ has already paid it all. And there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So please have faith and trust in the work of the Son. And I pray that we will come to walk in accordance with the Spirit, that we will be free to love, that we will be free to love Christ and one another. Amen. At this time, let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this uh, evening that we could... Uh, sing praises to you, pray to you, gather together and worship you and receive your word. Father God, thank you so much for um, the, the blessings that you have prepared for us this evening. That Lord, you are truly the one who, for, who has forgiven us and that you have reminded us that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Thank you so much, Father God, for this great gift of mercy that you've given to us the gift of faith through the Holy Spirit. Father, we pray, may we grow in that faith. May we grow in power and love for your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to have Christ in our sight at all times. And may we come to enjoy the fruit and the benefits of being in Christ. We thank you so much. We pray all this in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen.